Hey guys, and welcome to Tantrum House HQ. I'm Will Meadows. I'm Sarah Meadows. I'm Melissa Delp. And I'm Kevin Delp. Today we're looking at each of our top 10 published games of 2018. We've got a table full of all kinds of great games. If we went through all of our top 10s, 40 games, I, I hope you'd be willing to stay around long enough, but we're not gonna put you through that. We are gonna run through kind of our bottom five uh, pretty quickly, and then we'll spend a good chunk of our time on that top 25-ish, if you understand that, games. games that we've got together for you. For. Um, Kevin, do you wanna go ahead and start us off? Sure. What is on your, what is your number 10? My number 10 is Western Legends, and that is from Colossal Games. This was kickstarted last year. It came out and this is a sandbox adventure game. You can pretty much do whatever you want. You can go play poker for the whole game or you can go mine for gold. It's an awesome game. My number nine mm -hmm. is Pococo. Yes, like that one. This is a really cool trick taking game. I love trick taking games. This is um, unique in that it has the Hanabi effect where you can sort of not, you don't know what your cards are, but you see what other people's cards are. And I love the production of the actual peacocks. The plastic, yeah, yeah, those are pretty cool. cool. My number eight is Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig from Stonemeyer Games. And this is a combination or a sort of smash up between Between Two Cities and Castles of Mad King Ludwig. And I think it might be on other people's list, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> My number seven is Root from Leader Games. I really enjoyed their game called Vast, which pretty much everyone has their own, they're doing their own game, again, in the big game, but I didn't really like the theme as much. I like the theme of Root better, that woodland theme, and you can play the birds the or the meeples. cats. Yeah, yeah I cool mean, it's, stuff. and of course, Melissa, the <laughs> cute. Cute animal meeples. <laughs> That's right. And my number six is Newton, and that is from Simon. It is a wonderful Euro game. I really, really enjoy um, the um, route building. No, not route building. The, basically, the actions that you're taking because it's card driven, and it just really hits a sweet spot for me. So that's my 10 through 6. Melissa. All right, I'll jump in. My number 10 is Gizmos from Simon. It is a great engine building game and it has some really cool uh, elements with the dispenser and the marbles. My number nine is Tutor from Academy Games <laughs> and it is a worker placement game with some set collection and it has a lot of variability in the setup so each game is different and you're trying out different strategies. My number eight is Detective from Portal Games. We don't actually own it but we're playing a friend's copy and just the deduction aspect of it is really cool and using the internet to look up clues and putting things into the database really enjoy Detective. My number seven is the Whistle Stop Rocky Mountain expansion. Ooh, expansion. I love Whistle Stop and the expansion brings some three dimensionality to the game because you're going through the mountains. It helps you use gold better and it just adds uh, a little more variability to the stock market. So I really enjoy that. My number six is Wendake, and it is published by Renegade Game Studios, and it's another Euro game with some really cool ways that you choose your actions. It has a board that you have to kind of do almost a tic-tac-toe thing mm -hmm. on to get the actions that you want, and you have to uh, balance the different points you get because you get the lower of two tracks, and that becomes your score. I think it's score. a really underrated game of Yeah, I think so, definitely. Sarah, how about yours? All right, for my number 10, I have Dragon Castle. Ooh. I love how this game takes something that's very a simple, well-known Mahjong uh, game and then builds it up and gives you more choices and adds a your own tiling um, set yeah. collection into the game. My number eight, is, or number nine, number nine, is The Mind. Ooh. Uh, I love the social aspect of this game. I think it's key to play with people that you know. Mm -hmm. You have a lot more fun with it when you do that. Yeah. Pandasaurus brought that over to the States. That's great. Yes, uh, that's from Pandasaurus. Uh, number eight for me is Railroad Inc. I like games that everybody gets the same starting um, 
resources or set up, you know, set up everything, yeah. and then what you do with it is key and how you win the game. So I I like uh, the, she likes beating me at that. Uh, yes. it's, a great, it's a great it's a great roll and write. Yes, a great roll and write. Um, yeah, and I I like the components for that one. Um, my number seven. seven is Oregon Trail from Pressman. This one hit a sweet spot with me for nostalgia. <laughs> um, the uh, components were good. I, I loved the cards and how they um, brought in some of those um, disasters from the um, original video game. The video so game perfect. into it, yeah. The snake bites and dysentery oh, and all that's of awesome. that. And then my number six is actually between oh. two castles of Mad King Ludwig. Ooh, um, enjoyed my, playing cool. that one as well. My number 12. <laughs> what? Hell, what? <laughs> Architects of the Western Kingdom, 11, Starship Samurai, 10. Now we're into the real list. <laughs> well. <laughs> is uh, Endeavor Age of Sail. Really beautiful components. Love every single part of it from the trays to the pieces to the gameplay. Uh, really, really beautiful one. I think it might make it into other people's lists later. Um, Oregon Trail hit my uh, number nine spot as well. I enjoyed, I think we kind of shared the nostalgia value, which really helped that one out. Really cool tile placement uh, and just, yeah, very reminiscent, really good representation of the video game as a board game. Number eight is Thanos Rising for me. I uh, have had a blast playing that with the kids. I think anybody who is a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe can enjoy the game. You don't have to be a heavy one. You don't have to be a light gamer. Uh, I think it appeals and plays well with everybody. Really fun yeah. components. That was Liam's number one, right? It, yeah, it was. It was uh, which probably helped it boost up on my list. Because you got because to play of, it with the kids. Because of how much fun they That's had cool. with it, yeah. Um, number seven is Gunky Mono. Really enjoyed yeah. the uh, the tile placement strategy. Yeah, Renegade Game Studios. Uh, really just, it's abstract strategy, but it's tile placement and it's uh, your kind of control area control as well. So a lot of fun with that one. And then my number six is Good Critters from Arcane Wonders. Have played that a ton this year. It's a really easy game to teach people how to play. It's a lot of fun, the you split, I choose kind of thing. And uh, yeah, a lot of fun. I think from there, we're ready to roll into the top five. Woohoo! Let's go. Number, number five. five. My number five is Brass Lancashire from so Roxley pretty. Games. This is, like Will said, super pretty. I backed this Kickstarter last year and it finally is here. It's a great game from Martin Wallace. This actually was um, produced back in 2007 and they reprinted it and just blinged it out. I mean, there's poker chips and the artwork is amazing. I like the gameplay though. I actually never played the original. I played this Brass Lancashire. Mm -hmm. There's um, the different resources, how they are used, are really cool with the coal and the iron and things like that. I One of the things I really like in this is the way the money is used. Because you're going to be spending money to do different actions, but that actually uh, will make whatever your next turn will be. So your turn order is determined by how much money you're going to spend. I think that's pretty cool in, in a game like this. So Roxley Games did a great job with Brass Lancashire. Melissa! What do you have for your number five? My number five is Castell. It is published by Renegade Game Studios, and it is, I think, one of the most underrated games of this year. It came out at the beginning of the year, and I think it was overshadowed by many others. I agree. This is definitely a mid-weight Euro. There's a lot of thinking going on. You're traveling a lot around the region of Catalonia, and you are assembling your team of castellers and they make human pyramids so there's definitely a puzzling aspect to the game of how is the best way to build my pyramid to get the most points in different uh, contests that happen the different contests want different types of formations and different types of castellers so there's a lot going on a lot of thinking it might end up being a little slower of a game but i absolutely love it and it's a theme that isn't overdone it's kind yeah. of unique i think that would what drew me into the game is the actual theme that how well they were able to incorporate such a weird and unique concept yeah, yeah the whole thing a, yeah, i actually yeah. like on the board itself there's a run I don't know if I would say a rondelle, but basically like a circle in the bottom corner where you can take the different actions or things like that. I think I really enjoy that part of the yeah, game as well. Yeah, each round it shifts. So each region you're going to train a different attribute. So you're thinking ahead, oh, next round, mm -hmm. if I go there, I'm going to get this. So, you know, very much trying to think ahead, but I really enjoy it. Lots of fun. How about you, Sarah? 
My number five is Pococo from Brain Games. Uh, Kevin already had this in the bottom half of his top ten. Uh, the thing that I loved about this game, one, the components, awesome. I love the um, birds are actually plastic, so they're going to hold up longer than if they were cardboard. That's true, yeah. Um, I also like the aspect of you're not playing your cards and you can't see your cards. You're actually playing your neighbor's cards. And there is a betting mechanic that goes on of how which hand you think is going to do well. But it's not just how well that hand is. It's how well that person's going to play <laughs> that hand, which throws an interesting twist on a trick-taking game. I, I when like, you sit next yeah. to Ryan, even more interesting twist. Yeah. <laughs> I like the cards and how, you know, when you put them in... They, it looks like a peacock's yeah, feathers yeah. and well how well through. it was done with the, the cards as well. Yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I considered putting it in my top ten. Will, what do you have for number five? I'm looking at Everdell from Starling Games. This is a newer release, or at least newer play for me. Uh, it kind of just snuck into my top ten because I've been playing it so much recently. Uh, really excellent components in the game. It's got that Ever Tree, which is totally unnecessary, but adds some fun. And but it's some, cool. Yeah, yeah, some really nice table presence to the game. The components for the game are really nice. You got those squishy berries. It's a, a set collection game. It's a, I don't even know how to describe it because there's so many different things. It's worker placement primarily. And then you're also buying a bunch of cards and, and trying to chain those. So it's a little bit of engine building. It kind of just scratches a lot of those itches. And then it's really just gorgeous overall, which was the part that kind of drew me into it. But then being able to replay it because I like showing it off has been really fun every time. I have not played it yet. Me either. We really it's need on my bucket list. to play this one. Well, let's just do that tonight. <laughs> Number four. Dulasaur Island from Pandasaurus Games is my number four. This is only for two players and they did a great job. It's designed by Ian Moss and they, they actually have a couple games in this line. They have Dinosaur Island and that's more of a worker placement game. This is more of a drafting set collection type game and they did a wonderful job on the tension um, not only between the players because when you're drafting one person sets the, the dice and the cards and the other and they, you, know, you draft back and forth but even your own player board as you're creating dinosaurs as you are the, the threat is increasing you have to increase your security wonderful job in the tension and I love that how tight of a game that is trying to collect DNA trying to get money to build those your theme park so who doesn't want to build a dinosaur theme park <laughs> right so I do like the two-player part because you can kind of like it feel it does feel more intense when you know how many points that guy's getting each round and he's like you're so close and within distance of yeah. taking over yeah there was yeah. Fun. One one game I was I was the setter and I was dry, and I put out like a card that gave the other person like a bunch of points if they saw it right and then I was like oh they're gonna see that card so I put a die that was like this die times three so I got a lot of DNA out of it so it worked in my favor he could have taken the DNA instead of the card thinking I might not need it but I might have just taken hate drafted that card <laughs> so he didn't get it but it worked out in my favor. <laughs> All right, my number. Oh, your number four is down here, Melissa. Is one that we have talked about a few times Ooh. already. It's Between Two Castles by Stonemeyer Games, and this combines two of my favorite games, <laughs> Castles of Cat, <laughs> Castles of Mad King Ludwig yes. is my number one game of all time, and then I also enjoy Between Two Cities. And this is a great matchup of the two. It has the mechanics of Between Two Cities, but then a lot of the scoring of the castles of Mad King Ludwig. And I love that it kind of has that semi-cooperative aspect where you're building castles with the player on your right and the player on your left, and you're kind of trying to convince them to put the better things on the castle that you share. Um, <laughs> and then there's a lot of scoring that happens at the end, but that doesn't bother me at all. It's kind of interesting and you're, there's a little bit of suspense as you're waiting for each person to call out how many points their castle got to see, oh, did I win or did someone else win? So between two castles, the production value is great. Each of the castles has fun little pictures mm -hmm. in them. There's like 
a room with cats and dogs. There's even a scythe There's room. There's a scythe <laughs> room, yes. I think the, another cool thing with the production value is the game trays. Right. Because mm -hmm. um, when Jamie Stegmeier of Stonemeyer Games was designing this, how it's going to fit in that box, he worked with game trays to actually, so every stack of tiles is nine that you need. So there's this whole tray of uh, spots where you, nine tiles perfectly fit in. Right, basically when you uh, put the game away, it is ready to play the next time because it's genius. already in the stacks that you need. The thing that I'm most curious about now is that if this is your number four. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> what could it be about your two favorite games combined? I don't I know. even know. Blowing <laughs> my mind, just thinking about it. Okay, how about you, Sarah? All right, my number four is Ooh. Don't Mess With Cthulhu. <laughs> uh, this is a great party game for four to eight players. It's from Indie Boards and Cards. Uh, we have probably played this game the most this year. I agree with that. Uh, we have played probably 50 games with our kids. Oh, yeah, our just kids, our kids. Yeah, right? just yeah. our kids. <laughs> and then we've played it with a lot of game groups at cons. Uh, this is a great one late at night when mm -hmm. everybody is tired. Uh, you can still have a very, very enjoyable time um, and it's one that non game or non social deduction gamers do well at yeah Melissa. I will agree I almost put this in my top 10 for the year and I hate social deduction games I hate them but this one I actually enjoy because uh, there is some strategy to how you lie or don't lie and it's not so much of trying to Keep that poker get face. everyone onto your cause. Usually you're just interacting with one person at a time. And most people don't know who each other are. Whereas right. like in Werewolf for Others, you may know a little bit more information. So it's more of a deduction um, mm -hmm. on figuring out, okay, who has the other signs and who may have the Cthulhu. So. Will, what's your number four? Number four is Pictomania. Ooh. I even said the name right this time. <laughs> uh, from CGE Games. This one kind of caught me by surprise because it is very much just like a Pictionary type of game where you're drawing a picture and other people have to guess it. But I felt like they really added some fun speed stuff to it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the game, you have a specific image that you're trying to draw. You're trying to draw it as fast as you can because then you have to guess everybody else's and the order that you guess them in determines the number of points that you get. The crazy thing about the game is that some of the things you're drawing are like, especially once you get to the higher levels, are just like conceptual yes. words. Yes. They're not <laughs> objects at all. And so the, the way that you're drawing them is not necessarily like trying to describe the whole thing. You're just trying to be able to, from the list of options, get enough information into it that people can look at the list and determine what yours is you know, through deduction and or reduction, or I don't know what the word is, but <laughs> narrowing down all the options that it's not. And that actually gives it a layer of strategy that goes beyond just drawing something fast, like thinking through what to draw. I enjoy real-time games. I do very well at this game because I do well at drawing and at, at having that conceived idea and being able to get it on paper, um, which makes for a really fun experience. I've, I've had fun playing this every single time. I've had a blast that I've played it. Yeah, I think it's interesting that each card has similar words. So you may have a card that has short story, novel, essay, lyrics, poem. And so you're trying to distinguish your specific picture from the others. Yeah. And Pictomania, just so uh, viewers are aware, is this is actually a, a reprint. A reprint. Yeah. It's been out for a while, but I think uh, CGE did a good job with um, not only Updated the Updated art and yeah. some yeah, new concepts and things. That's and cool. I think it comes with the dry erase. Is it pencil? It's pencil, pencil. Pencil and paper. Pencil and paper. Pencil and paper. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. Really, really enjoy this one. Number three. Scythe, Rise of Fenris is actually an expansion to one of my favorite games, Scythe. This it brings a campaign mode to uh, the world of Scythe. Uh, Stonemeyer Games did a wonderful job in, in uh, incorporating just a lot of stuff in the game. I don't want to give away too much, but you can either play the campaign mode. Melissa and I actually played through the whole campaign. There's eight games. It's a wonderful experience and just enhances uh, just more of your knowledge of the world of Scythe and just what you're trying to do. I think it just breathes new life into the game. 
game of scythe. And it's fun unlocking little boxes yeah, and right. finding new you know, surprises throughout. But if you don't do the campaign, which you don't have, you could use the same number of players or the same people to do the campaign. I would actually recommend it. But um, you could just not do the campaign and just unlock the different modules that are in the in the game itself. Um, one of the cool things is the track where you're putting your stars on. There's some cool twists to that. There might be some new um, mechs and minis that um, are unlocked. So um, the storyline is cool. Um, everything about Scythe is cool. So Scythe, Rise of Fenris, you need to get it. <laughs> yeah, and I would say we've done the campaign. Maybe we'll do it again after a while. But some of those modules, anytime we play Scythe now, I think we're going to incorporate some of those into the game. I don't know that we've played the base version of the game ever again. I agree with that. Melissa, you have a uh, number three? I do. It is Queenbra yeah. from Eggert Spiel. This is a game that I have been wanting and wanting to play all year. I finally got it at PAX Unplugged and really enjoyed it. It's sort of not quite a dice worker placement, maybe dice drafting. And the interesting thing is that you use the dice two different ways. In one area, the pip value is what you're looking at. And then in another part of the game, it's the color. Wow. So that's something that takes a little while to yes. wrap your mind around which aspect of the die is important in this phase of the game. But there's a lot of variability in it with the different goals and how you can earn points. I focused a lot on purple, which is moving around the board, and I was getting lots <laughs> of bonuses and unlocking things. There's a set collection aspect to the cards. So there's a lot to think about, but uh, I just love the choices in it. And it's, it's really pretty. It has some great pops of color in it. And I know, Will, you really like it too. I would say more things about it, except for oh. I might be talking about it oh. again. Oh! Might be making another appearance. <laughs> How about you, Sarah? My number three is Dice Hospital from Alley Cat Games. Dice worker placement is one of my favorite mechanics, Ooh, and I was glad to see another new one out this year with that mechanic. Because uh, I don't think there's a ton of... So, publishers... Take note of that. Yeah. Make some more dice work place yeah. the game. There's a few, but that, you know. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed the hospital theme. I think it uh, reminded me of uh, some video games I may have played growing up that you are trying to take care of all the patients, and there's so many coming in, you just can't handle it all. Um, I liked that tension in the game of uh, making decisions as to uh, which patients to treat and which ones to maybe just let them hold on one more round before I treat them the next round. Um, it's got some interesting ways to um, get either some high value dice that are patients who are a little more healthy that can make it out of your hospital quicker. Alive. <laughs> Alive, yes. And then, we can save the ones that need to be saved. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so this is one that I enjoyed this year. One of the things I enjoyed about both of these games is the little dice holders. I think that's a really cool yeah. thing that we're seeing this year. This has the ambulances that you put the dice in. That's got the castle turret things. Um, that component is just a really fun piece that we need to see more of that as well, publishers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Will. Uh, so my number three is War Chest from Ooh. AEG. Uh, really enjoyed uh, the component quality on this. The, mm -hmm. the, the poker tips are really, really heavy and nice. The artwork is just really pristine across the whole game. I love the consistency of it. The color scheme is great. The magnetic box, every part of the component part of it is great. And then I really enjoy a good abstract strategy game, which this scratches that itch. Uh, and I love the fact that it's either two or four players, so you can play it as a team, which I think adds a whole nother layer of interest to it. I'm trying to you know, coordinate with the, the abilities that your partner has as well as with you. Uh, the board layout is interesting and creates, I mean, it's just that hexagonal honeycomb, uh, but it creates the way that you collect points by getting those uh, marker tokens on the board is an interesting strategy to the game. And the fact that that can turn over back and forth really kind of creates a fun experience. Uh, and I've had a lot of fun playing it with uh, like really thinky players as well as just my kids. They've enjoyed it and been able to pick it up. And then it is really heavy strategy, but because you're pulling those things out of that bag, 
and you get a random draw every time, uh, there's a lot of variability and randomness to it as well. And I like the balance that this game does with those two pieces, which I don't see in a lot of other games. The heavy strategic and the random chance. Yeah, I think if you like chess, this might be something that you want to try out. Uh, it's not quite the same, but it has that same turn-by-turn um, -turn movement of trying to eliminate the other player. So I, I have I not played War Chest. I don't think Melissa and I are either. No, it's another one. Need, need to try to, it out again. Get together right. and play some more games. I, mean, I have played. I played you would think doing that every week would be enough, but <laughs> yeah, I have so many games. I played the Duke, um, and it sounds like what you're saying. There could be some similarities. I haven't to played it. the Duke, so okay. now I need to try out that one apparently. Yeah. But but I think that's only two player. Okay. So the yeah. cool thing so that you said about the two nice. or and four it expands really well for yeah. four, and because there's so many different tokens to choose from, you're going to mm -hmm. get a different right. experience a little bit okay. every time. Cool. War chest. Number two. Well, I have Chronicles of Crime here yeah. from Lucky Duck Games. We actually uh, saw the prototype of this a while back and we're super excited. It's got the mystery puzzle trying to solve a mystery, but it also brings in some electronics like an app plus a VR experience. It just does all of that so well and it combines all those different elements so well to make a wonderful, wonderful board game. And even though you're going to figure out what the mystery is, there's a lot of different scenarios in the base game. There's like five different um, scenarios that you can play. Plus, there's so many more that are coming out. And I've heard some others that are coming out in the future. So they've got some great things that are coming for Chronicles of Crime. But even the base game itself is an amazing experience. I can't spoil too much, but... It, like the tutorial, you're like, I know some of you have played this, you're yeah. like looking in the VR and you're like, what is that? <laughs> so the way they integrate it and through the storyline, um, it works seamlessly. Yep, very much so. Melissa, what's your number three? Well, Kevin, Kevin number two. Number two. Number two. <laughs> Kevin and I are very in sync on this one because I also chose Chronicles of Crime. And uh, I just love the mystery deduction kind of story type games. I love Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, Chronicles of Crime, Detective mm -hmm. from Portal was in my lower half of the top 10. And what I really like about this one is the way that the app integrates. You are scanning the people, the suspects that you're questioning, and then you can scan a card to ask them basically about a specific clue or another person. So it feels sort of interactive. It's not just, oh, I read a little section out of a book. Mm -hmm. The information you get and what they say is determined by the different um, articles, items that you ask them about. So. And all of that takes time, so mm -hmm. if you... I was going to mention that. The time is a, yeah, a key aspect to the game. The, the app designates certain time to each thing that you do, so you could scan every single thing, but you're eating up your time, and certain things may happen if you take too much time, or your score could go down. So there's a lot yeah. of interesting talking mm -hmm. with the group of... Do you think we should ask her about the rope? Or oh, maybe the rope's not important. Or do you think this person knows that person? So I really love the kind of figuring out the mystery in a little bit more interactive way that comes with Chronicles of Crime. Yeah, that definitely upped it for me too because I'm not as huge of a fan of the Sherlock Holmes like just read a bunch of text and get, turn to page 22 type of thing. It's all mental. It's right. all on your mind trying to figure it out. This really does take it up a level. It probably could have been at the top of my top 10 because I really did enjoy the experience that it creates but it's just not my type of game normally. Okay. But this could pull me into that type of game very well. Cool. All right, Sarah, my number what? two is Endeavor Age of Sail. This is from Burnt Island Games and Grand Gamers Guild. Uh, it is a updated edition of the original Endeavor game. Uh, what I love about this one is the artwork is absolutely fantastic. The, it comes with all the game trays. So before there was a lot of sorting of components and setting up tiles hmm. that you may not be able to see on the other side of the um, table. This one has a game tray with all the buildings. The first thing you do is build a building on the round and you just have a tray that you pass and oh, you can cool. see exactly what you need to build. Uh, the game is really easy to learn. Everything um, just makes sense as to what you need to do. There are four tracks to um, keep track of and gain tokens and points throughout the game. Um, normally, area control is not my favorite mechanic, but this one did it so well that it made it number two this year. Wow. 
Yeah, I really enjoyed this one. Sarah and I both taught it to people during PAX Unplugged. So, you know, the when they first sit down, it looks a little overwhelming because there's tokens all over the place and you have this board with and slots. Your board and the central yeah. board. Yeah. <laughs> but the game, the graphic design, I think, was great in this. It walks you through the phases on your player board so you know okay we do this then we do this then we do this and i think by around two or three we didn't even really need to help the demoers anymore yeah. they could walk through it themselves impressive. there may be like one or two questions about a specific icon but people were able to pick it up really quick and i think that's great it looks a lot heavier than it is and it plays in about an hour so I, I agree. Well, and Endeavor's it really, a great game. I mean, it really is a meaty game that does require a lot of thought and strategy. Mm -hmm. But you're right because of the the iconography and just the the cheat sheet. Basically, like it's an easy game to understand, which is yes. very cool. What's your number two, Will? <laughs> Surprise! <Ooh. laughs> uh, yeah, this one, everything Melissa said, times two or whatever. Uh, really enjoyed this one. The very first time that I played it, it just like left me hungry to try it again because there are so many different ways to gain points in the game. Will just doesn't want to say the word Queenbra because he's not really <laughs> sure how to say it. Queenbra <laughs> is my favorite game. Um, from Eckertspiel. Uh, is really uh, it's the type of game where you you have to play it a bunch of times to really be able to master it and figure out what works best together and then because you still are dealing with the randomness of the dice that strategy is also going to change every time because you're going to be able to do better at certain things depending on what dice and what color and what numbers come up so really really replayable i think um really great art like she said i love the color scheme i love that they went with kind of a different scheme than we see in a lot of games typically and the components are really nice those turrets are a lot of fun really just enjoyed playing it and really want to play it a bunch more times and that for me is one of the keys for what a good game is like if i finish and it was fun great if i finish and it was fun and i want to play again really bad that's when it goes up higher on the list and this one definitely did that for me this i think is one of the most surprising things on the list because that we both had it so high <laughs> well and i mean well for me i think that you're usually more of the social and the aspect Which where number one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is more of a euro strategy game so when you came back and said that it was awesome. I was like, oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, I mean, not that you don't like those types of games. <laughs> My taste but is terrible, but I mean. <laughs> we're, we're usually not like very similar in our list. So I thought and that was really interesting. Hours. I mean, it's it an is. investment, it's a couple not, hours, right? It's not a yeah. super short one, no. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's cool. I agree, I think my list ended up being abstract strategy, party games, and Queen Wow, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Number one. It's Rising Sun from Seamon. It's a good one. <laughs> this came out very, very early in 2018. And this is amazing. I backed this and got pretty much everything uh, that is here. You can see the Did miniatures. Good job painting those. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I painted the miniatures, enjoyed the process of just um, enjoying the creative process of painting them. They in the game how these monsters are working with your clans and how each clan has its own specific power that it can activate and use throughout the game is cool so the variable player powers are awesome about the game i like the movement on the board the really cool thing with the mandate tiles your actions that you're taking is a draft so i like drafting type games as you saw with dual sword island so love drafting in games and um, those actions are fun taking them with maybe teaming up with another and allying with another clan and then the actual war how you're actually doing that isn't just like rolling dice and be like my guy beats your guy sort of thing there's this sort of there's a player screen and you are sort of spending money on different parts of the war should i try and you know really beat out all the other players by doing um by spending the money on there or should i just kill all my guys and get points and seppuku you know <laughs> sort of this honorable death thing i love how that works or take someone hostage all how that works really hits all the really cool sweet spots for me in a board game i was actually kind of concerned i'm not really really big into board games i think melissa would probably say the same thing Right, yeah. I wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy Rising Sun, and I am a little weak on the negotiation alliance aspect of the game, but I do really enjoy that war board that you have and how you have different options of how you want to score points during the war phase. And it's a little bit of trying to read your opponents. Do I think they're going to take me hostage? If I do, maybe I should kill myself first before they try to take me hostage. Um, and 
that aspect was very thinky and not just, oh, I have more dudes than you, I win, or I roll a die and see what happens. Right. So I, I really do enjoy that aspect of the game. I thought it was very unique and um, satisfying. Mm -hmm. I think even the board itself, when you're putting out your, your your armies on the board, it looks like, oh, there's so much, um, so many armies, it looks like, oh, the, all this war is going to happen, but I mean, some of them may be allies. I mean, this how that works could be different game to game to game and I, I love how even though this the sort of area influence uh, how that works with the war tiles and the mandate tiles and the awesome miniatures from Simon hits a home run full it's package a, hits a home run for me yeah, rising sun yeah, yeah. from Simon Melissa what is your number one my number one is Newton and it is published by Simon and Cranio Creations and it is it was on Kevin's list earlier it is a action selection game with it's card driven so you're playing cards down into your study board to take certain actions the cool thing is that each card has a certain action icon and if you've already played cards with that action then you're it's going to be more powerful when that. you play it again so you're going to be able to move farther or buy more or um just take more of an action. There's also a set collection aspect with trying to get to certain places so then you can study and put bookshelves on your board. There's so many ways to get points. There's extra powerful cards that you can play if you get to certain areas on the board. Um, it's, it's really thinky, but it makes sense. And I really like the theme of the science you have like Isaac Newton and you're making discoveries and traveling around the world and trying to uh, unlock different uh, technologies so Newton I, I like the um, that it, it's not too mean it's right. not too mean there's two things in the game that um, could be could, you know described as mean one is you know there are cards it's a card driven game so someone may take the card that you want but that's more of like they not they may may or may not know that right right it's there's not really a whole lot of hate drafting or take that in the game it's more of your strategies are sort of the similar as someone else you may be going after the same things yep. and there's also yeah, the second thing Competing. certain tokens that if you get there first you get that token and it's a bonus so i may have been planning to do that on my fourth action and someone gets there on their second or third. Mm -hmm. um, I do like that you can basically plan out your whole round because you know what cards you have or which ones you're trying to get. So there's not as much downtime between turns as long as people have sort of thought through. Um, it has variability in the setup. There are different end goals. Again, that's something I love, kind of the discovery aspect of a game. How, what do I do? this specific game to get points, which may be different than the setup that we had last time. So I really enjoy Newton. I think it's a interesting theme and I love the decisions that you make throughout. Good choice, Melissa, good choice. All right, Sarah, number one. My number one this year is Welcome To cool. from Deep Water Games. Uh, this one's a little bit lighter for me, but I enjoy that you could play this with as many players as you want, as long as they have one of the um, neighborhood sheets and a pencil. Um, I love that, like I said before, with Railroad Inc., everyone is given the exact same information and what you do with it and how well you use the information is how well you're gonna do in the game. Um, it's a very short game, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, everyone is using the cards that are shown for the round. There's three cards flipped and then there's also a corresponding uh, action that kind of goes with it where you're either going to build a fence or you're going to um, uh, have a, add a park to your neighborhood and all of those things basically everything gives you points towards the end of the game That's cool. and so um, I love the puzzly thinkiness to this one um, it is very simple to teach and learn and yet everybody comes up with a totally different answer at the end even though with the same information yeah I think the puzzle part is definitely what appeals to you yes. like being able to just really optimize 
one of which one of these three choices is the absolute best and how can I get the most points out of that for this turn um, it, it is really slick I love that it is like just a small box format but it does create a lot of fun for a lot of people and yeah I've been playing that one too I think deep water actually was doing so well with it they decided to run a Kickstarter and add yes. some even more things was to there a it Christmas so expansion or something I can't remember I Halloween, Halloween. Halloween yeah. that's right. well they had lots of different <laughs> themes that they added on yeah. so different so, sheets with more coming more yes. coming from walking too Will, what's your number one? This is back! <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss Hulu Deluxe. Uh, the Deluxe part does add some nice things to the game, and we've mm -hmm. already talked about it a little bit. I, j I mean, we explained a little bit of the gist of the game, but I think the thing that I just really enjoyed the most is that I've played this hundreds of times this year. It came out at the very early in the year. People started like asking me if I had played it. I didn't know what it was. I finally got a hold of it. Um, I've we've played it at all the cons I think that we've been to. Yes, this yes. is the one that we pull out at the midnight hour and play till 2 a.m. because we don't realize what time it is. Uh, it plays really quick. It's great that you can play just the base version one time. Everybody understands. Then you add in the additional cards and then you add in the tokens. And so it just keeps getting better and better as you play it over and over. I don't think there's any way like to... Um, master a strategy in this game. <laughs> <laughs> because no, it's definitely reading other players. Right. Com yeah, communicating with them, getting them on your team, yeah. um, being, you know, you've got to kind of lie one round and then tell the truth the next round, and so you never know who to trust in the game. It, it's so easy to explain, though, that, like, little kids can play it and have a blast. Mm -hmm. um, we've played it with more, I don't know what the player count is on eight, it, but eight. Eight. we've definitely played it with more than eight <laughs> players before. Uh, you can kind of cram in other people if you need to and reduce the number of cards. It doesn't, I mean, it's really flexible. Um, I think this is one of those games that, you know, a lot of these games, we'll play them a bunch more times next year, and then they'll kind of get buried in the shelf, and new stuff will come out. Not Rising Sun. No. <laughs> this game, I think, is going to be at the top of my party sure. game packing pile. Yeah. 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 Every day, every game thing I go to for the next hundred years. I don't know. Um, it's just, it fits perfectly in the party game thing. It appeals to people that aren't, like you said, mm -hmm. the, you know, secret identity type Social of people connection. normally. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, I've played it a lot. I've had fun every single time I've played it. I've never had like a game where I've been like, I hope this one ends soon, you know, or whatever. Like, it's just an enjoyable experience every single time. And uh, have I said enough? I love it. <laughs> and it does create those big moments. <laughs> right. Um, yes. What? You lied to me? I'm never trusting you again. <laughs> I can't believe that. So, yeah. Um, Very high energy. <laughs> stories. Definitely yeah, stories. I think you definitely enjoy the five minutes after the game right. of yes. going through everything that happened and talking about, you know, you did this and that. I thought this, but that wasn't right. And you lied. And yeah, yep. those are the moments that you enjoy. <laughs> Very, very much. Yep. Excellent stuff. So if you uh, enjoyed uh, some of these games, let us know in the comments below. If you have some of your favorite games from 2018, did we leave been... anything out? Was there anything left? Oh, there was a, a lot of, there was there a lot of games sure. left that we didn't And there's a anything. lot of games that we weren't able to play um, right. that I would like to talk about in the future. Maybe we'll do a video about some uh, bucket the list, bucket list, <laughs> bucket list yeah, games something. from 2018, and hopefully we'll get to play those in 2019. Thanks for joining us uh, on this top 10 video. Check out our other videos on Tantrum House, and be sure to subscribe to our channel.